Okay, let's go ahead and get ourselves started. So thank you for coming and joining us today. What we want to do today is really kind of share just a lot of practical like examples of sort of things that are uh, going on in the classroom now, trying to incorporate sustainability into the beginning design team curriculum, and kind of really try to learn from each other in terms of best practices and lessons that we've all been learning through these. You know, my, in my job at Autodesk, I actually work with a lot of different universities and a lot of different faculty um, trying to help them incorporate technology into the curriculum. So I have this really unique opportunity to see uh, interesting projects going on just really throughout the country and then really learn about things like the whole University of Rome project we look at um, through connections to uh, between the projects to other universities throughout the world. And we really just uh, wanted to go ahead and share, let me go ahead and talk to this. Some just basic ideas of like uh, really what we think is going to be you know sort of most helpful as you think about trying to incorporate these sorts of things in your own curriculum. So it's all going to start with just looking at the whole issue of how we motivate design students, and Adam's going to do some talking about that in terms of really some ideas about really what gets them motivated and gets them moving. Then we're going to look at some specific examples of innovative classes and studios, talk about the techniques, the outcomes, and some of the lessons from the Rome student project, and also from Uda's project. And then I'll go ahead and take a look at just some of the tools and resources that are available through Autodesk and other sources that uh, go ahead and help you incorporate this stuff in your own curriculum. But what we'd really like to do is, towards the end, reserve some time to make sure that we have time to really discuss this stuff. And I'd love to even have something a little bit deeper than your average, just kind of just Q&A, like one or two things. It'd be really good to actually start diving in a little bit and start thinking about if you could share a little bit about what's going on in your own classes and curriculum. We can, you know, just really kind of dig in a little bit deeper. Really, it's all about trying to engage and activate and give you stuff that you can take home and start like uh, implementing, like right away. Okay, so as we get started, the first point was really, you know, I like the idea of focusing on the mission at the really beginning design students and what's so special about students in that part of the process. And my experience personally in terms of working with beginning design students is that at Stanford University, I teach in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I actually have one of the first classes that an awful lot of civil and, arch civil and architectural students will take. It's a building information modeling class, which seems like kind of an odd thing to have freshmen and sophomores and even new graduate students take. But pretty much everyone who comes in the department ends up taking that because really this notion of how we model things on computers and share things with computers has become very, very central to the way we really work in the AEC industry right now. So architects, engineers, construction folks share things through these models. And although we have this very diverse group of students, you try to imagine how students who are freshmen are working together with seniors and graduate students, it actually ends up working very, very successfully in a whole series of different studio-oriented design problems. Because what we're really finding is that everyone has a little bit something different to offer to it, and that really is almost a pretty good mirror of how it works in real life. So in terms of getting started, the students that are coming in, the ones who are really the very beginning design students, I'd like to really think about in terms of, oh, what we want to focus on. One thing, although they don't have a lot of experience and analytical skills to bring to the equation yet, they haven't built those yet, one thing they do have is fantastic design intuition. Okay, and that's something we really try to capitalize on. I know personally, this is one of the things that really got me going in the whole world of architecture and engineering was that you know, my dad was a contractor, I basically followed him around on projects. Growing up, I would always, if there was something being built anywhere near my house, I'd be at that site playing around where I should be playing around, just sort of experiencing it firsthand. It was just inherently very, very interesting. And what happened was, you start actually knowing a whole lot more about how design and construction works before you're even trained about it, just because you see it so much. Okay? And that's really what I think we can start to capitalize on. For most of the students coming in, whether it's for me, it was more the architectural design experience, but even in terms of sustainability now, students are so exposed to sustainability as they grow to the basic issues and they have a basic awareness of what's going on with sustainability that we can actually go ahead and capitalize on a lot of the intuition they bring into it. Okay. And some of the intuition we'll find out is maybe a little bit wrong, but it actually is a very good starting point to go with. The other thing that I think is sort of so incredible about these first year students is that they're so eager to learn. Then in terms of learning, they, they want to go ahead and absorb new knowledge. When they want to learn knowledge, they look to us as experts to go and help them sort of understand what the knowledge is that they need to be looking for. But they're also quite eager to learn from the peers. So the whole idea of the beginning design students and how they can learn from the upperclassmen, from the juniors and the seniors who've already been to a lot of the studios, 
and have a lot of uh, the analytical skills. You know, it's really important to go ahead and capitalize on that, but they, they're very eager. In fact, I find that they tend to be a much more eager and receptive audience than a lot of the upper classmen. Who at that point are more concerned about jobs and going on to graduate school and maybe a little bit hardened by the process. You know, I think at that early stage, they're actually very, very, I won't say malleable, but they're eager to kind of take on new things and very receptive. So I think that's actually kind of a good thing about them. I think another thing that's really good about this stage in their life is that they're very anxious to prove themselves and to fit in. So they really do try very, very hard. And I find, especially for new ones coming to school, uh, I, I still remember you know, uh, being a freshman this back at MIT many, many years ago, but this whole notion of do I belong here, how do I compare to all my colleagues, just really how do I fit in, how do I sort of you know, make my own place in this world, was really a very motivating thing in terms of really getting me going on some different things. Okay, if we look at how we tend to approach these students in a lot of traditional curricula, we use this approach which I'll call kind of a slow, steady build which I think has some problems, but we can talk about that. Where very often during the freshman year, we start out with all these foundation level courses. So for me, it was calculus and physics, and there were all these things that were kind of things that were, you know, it was considered essential that I know all these things before I go very far. What happened next is we started getting into the fundamentals, in the School of Engineering where I am, and that's when, oh, people learn statics, they learn the economy, they learn thermodynamics and things like that. You know, Maybe around my junior year, I'm starting to get some skills that are looking interesting. I'm actually doing some real structural design work. I'm doing some design work for more, fo more focused in my discipline. Okay. You know, we get through that design phase. We start to be in studios and working that way. I know in architecture schools, it's different, but there's sort of a parallel path in terms of what's going on. But finally, somewhere at the end of this entire first experience, we get to these integrated real-world studios and capstone experiences where you finally get to take on a really interesting, needy problem that doesn't have, you know, what is it, an easy solution, and you get to work with people on the outside, and you really get to do something that's quite, quite motivating. And my point about all this is really, I'm a little bit worried about this process in terms of are we losing people before we get there? Like, in my experience with working with students, I can count, you know, very vividly. The many architecture students who I've worked with who basically stop out before they actually get to the interesting stuff because they got stuck on thermodynamics. So they got stuck on some very basic engineering, we think it was an engineering core prerequisite, okay? and they never actually got a chance to experience the cool stuff that they were really getting into the whole thing core. <coughs> I know for me, one of my favorite experiences, I actually was a jumper in terms of prerequisites. I really sort of hate the notion of prerequisites. So one of the most fulfilling things that I did was as a freshman, I actually took the senior level structures course in architecture at MIT. And somehow, between intuition and trying to keep up with the upperclassmen and stuff like that, I actually had the most fantastic time of any course that I took that entire freshman year. And that's what actually got me to go ahead and do this majoring in civil engineering and architecture. It was really, you know, I found my calling, but I didn't find that in my freshman level classes. I found that in the senior level classes. And that's always stuck with me. And I think that's something I try to bring to my own classes at Stanford. I try not to treat the freshmen as though they don't know anything. I really try to treat them as professionals right from the start. And even though they're mentors to the senior students, I think they really do have a lot. And there's something very motivating and fulfilling. When they leave that class, they feel very empowered to go out and keep on going. So let me go ahead and just talk about this whole notion of enhancing design intuition. Because it sort of starts with the notion of really having awareness. We, students need to sort of be aware of the basic issues, and we do a good job of exposing them to that. Then they need to start gaining insight about those issues. And on the issue of insight, I find there's sort of an interesting thing about that, in that it tends to be much easier to gain insight by looking at other people and what they're doing than looking at your own work. And I think you actually sort of see that along the way in Structure Studios now, where it's very, very helpful to go ahead and look at uh, reference projects and look at the examples of what the masters are doing before we try to design it ourselves because there's so much to be learned and if we try to really step back away from our designs that's actually a very very hard thing to do you're so invested in your design ideas it really is very hard to be critical about them step back far enough to actually go through and reevaluate and decide whether or not this is good or maybe I should go in an entirely different way so 
Yeah, I think you, you, yeah, I know that from my own life. It's very hard to sort of learn from my own experience. However, I can tell you all about what you're doing and what I think you should be doing better. And it's, I think design students have a very similar sort of thing going. Okay. We're really looking at now, and what I've really been promoting recently, is this whole notion of informed design. And the idea is there really is a cycle to all this where we start with the ideating, it's the idea of creating the idea, you know, just really sort of formulating the idea, but we go through a whole cycle that starts with modeling it, ultimately simulating and testing that idea, and then assessing the idea to really see how well it played out. And this is an iterative cycle, it's really one that we can try to strive for in our studios with various degrees of success. But this whole notion of this process, that it really is, it's not just I have the idea and I'm going to keep on going with that, adding more and more detail to it, what's done, but that there's this whole iteration to it, really is kind of a mirror of the way it needs to be in industry and how it works in industry, but also it's kind of oh, how we're approaching things even at Autodesk relative to what's going on in terms of supporting students in this way. If you look at AutoCAD and Revit and some of the modeling tools that we've been using in the past, we've been focusing a lot on the how you take your idea and convert them into models, but I think what you're seeing now, what you're going to be seeing over the next couple of years, is a whole lot more attention put into simulation analysis tools, so that you can take your basic model, understand the energy performance, understand the structural performance, understand the cost and the constructability of it, but really understand what you're proposing and then bring that back so you can make better design decisions. And how I think that sort of is relevant to the students in this whole process is, if you think about sort of, oh, this whole cycle, the whole notion of tools and skills and all of those things that we want to give you, typically in your junior or senior year where we really focus on some of the really detailed skills, they're kind of sort of down in one quadrant the whole notion of creativity and intuition, it's really up at the other side. It's sort of in, as we move from assessment to ideating, it's more about creativity and intuition. And as you think about that whole cycle, if I think about really what I want my students to carry away, it's not the tools and the skills, because honestly, you know, any tool I teach you this year is going to be irrelevant. Well, not irrelevant, but it's going to change a few years from now, and even the skills are probably going to change somewhat. But the whole notion of how you approach the creative process and really the fact that there is a process and a cycle to it, that's the thing that's going to carry you through the next 20 and 30 years. Because that's the part that doesn't change. It's not time dependent. Okay? So with that as a little bit of an introduction, let me go ahead and actually turn it over to some of our guests to actually share some, some of their experience. The first one we're going to be hearing from is Adam Mentor. He's our Sustainability Education Program Manager at Autodesk. So he's been working on all sorts of sustainability projects and thinking about how students adopt those. He was the, uh, he's definitely very, very relevant to the conference, conference theme. So Adam, like, uh, let's go ahead and like, uh, have you take over. And do you want to try starting your video? Great, yeah, I just tried starting it, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but... Uh, okay, no worries if it doesn't. You have a nice smiley face to go from, so... Uh, okay, great. Let's go um, and get ourselves started. All right, great. So thanks for the intro, Glenn. Uh, my background's in mechanical engineering, and I uh, have an MBA as well, and prior to coming to Autodesk, I was working in design strategy. Um, one of the reasons I, I came to Autodesk is because of Autodesk's commitment to sustainability. Um, and Glenn, maybe advance the slide? Uh, so, that, so that we're looking at the one with the uh, redwood tree on the right? Correct. All right, great. Um, so during this talk, I, didn't, I, I wanted to focus on how you can um, use sustainability to help improve the educational outcomes of your students. And I, you know, I don't want to dwell too much on the sustainability and the environment because I think sustainability is much more than the environment. Next slide. Really, it's a way of tapping into the hearts and minds of your students. Um, and and it's in tapping into into this idea of sustainability uh, that you can create some really powerful educational experiences. And I'm going to tell you sort of three easy steps in my mind to help you understand how to use sustainability in your coursework. So next slide. So the first step is to stoke your students' motivation and tap tap into motivation that's already there. Um, but first, a little bit of background of, of the world that these students have grown up in. So next slide. So uh, global warming, carbon emissions, this, these are things that are on the news. Students have been hearing about this you know, ever since they can remember, I'm sure. Inconvenient truth probably um, is you know, culturally significant to them. Um, still, this stuff is still a little bit intangible. So next slide. 
at the same time, they're seeing and hearing about environmental problems in the news. So Deepwater Horizon oil spill, those things are more tangible, more immediate. Um, next slide. And all along the way, so you know, they're, they're hearing all this, uh, the earth is sick, uh, it's important to reduce, reuse, recycle, and they're taught to they're taught to be environmental superheroes from a very early age. So literally, I grew up watching Captain Planet, who was a superhero on uh, saving the environment. Earth Day is ingrained to their education from their earliest memories. They get excited, inspired, and empowered by this stuff. I still remember when I was in elementary school. Uh, one of the Earth Day projects was to like sort of do a little audit of your house and, and take a look at energy use and water use. And I remember uh, filling up a milk jug in the shower and, and recording how long it took to fill, fill it up. And then, you know, that was a nice little lesson volumetric flow rate. But it, I learned that our shower head could, we could get, a, get by with a lower flow shower head. And uh, I convinced my parents to get a lower flow shower head. And that was like a point of pride for me. And that was like, a, a, I, I felt empowered. If I felt like I was doing something good. And that's the kind of stuff that sticks with students. Um, next slide. And so you'll see that same energy channeled into clubs these days. So uh, if you're in the engineering realm, things like Engineers for a Sustainable World, Engineers Without Borders, so, so are Decathlon, others. Um, so what's happening is these students are becoming more powerful agents of change, but their goal is still the same. Their goal to make the world a better place is still there. And so relatedly, um, you know, you hear a lot about the millennial generation and how they're different from previous generations. One thing is that they're no longer looking for a career track and a paycheck. They're looking for a career that leads to a sense of fulfillment and tangible impact. So you as educators can help, you know, show students the way. If you can tie engineering, design, and architecture to these issues that they already care about, um, you're basically helping them create the future that they want to create, and you're inspiring them to, to stay in engineering. Um, which is you know, one of the things that Glenn, things that Glenn was talking about, losing, losing great people because they're not seeing the connection and they're, they're not passionate. Um, next slide. So in addition to these projects that are really powerful, um, in the classroom what you can do is connect sustainability to your coursework in meaningful ways. You know, so this, is a, this is a little screen clipping from a video series that we have. Um, that is all about you know helping to understand the fundamentals of sustainable design, getting down to the physics of things, understanding energy and materials. So you can make you know if you're teaching fluid, fluid dynamics, you can make coefficient of drag all about energy efficiency in uh, in vehicles. Use these types of examples. Make make the equations relevant with this thing. Heat transfer. It can be all about passive design in buildings. Um, and so we have a whole series of videos that can help you do that. Um, uh, the character you're seeing here is named Mr. Imagination. Uh, I would recommend checking them out. We'll give you the URL afterwards. It's like a three to six minute videos that you can show in your class to introduce a lot of these concepts and then dive into derivations or dive into design activities or whatever, whatever is appropriate. So next slide. So that's the first step. Tapping into motivations. Uh, the second step is demonstrating uh, and sort of showing students what good looks like. So, um, next slide. Um, stories are really sticky and powerful, and so are role models. Um, so the person that you're seeing here is named Bjark Engels. He's a uh, he's an architect from Denmark. Um, you know, he may look like Justin Bieber, but he's like actually somebody who's like inspiring generations of like young young architects all over the world right now um, he's a rock star he's cool you know the the images up in the upper right is actually like a little graphic novel that came out about him and fast company so it's like these sorts of people um, are can be role models to your students um, and when you can tie design to stories and to people, it becomes really sticky. So next slide. And so what we're seeing here is one of the projects that, that he's worked on. It's, uh, it's in Copenhagen. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's obviously, what's powerful about this is it's not only sexy, it's smart. Um, he has a good talk called Hedonistic Sustainability, a TED, it's a TED talk. 
Um, and that's even the kind of thing that you could show your students or have them look at it for homework. Um, these sorts of things that are out in culture that are exciting, but that also relate back to, to some of the work that you're doing. And the trick is finding things that are both inspiring and technically rigorous and accurate. So this house, for example, or this is the community development um, and the shape of the building allows for you know, really interesting interactions between the occupants. So they did a lot of thinking about how to create community. Um, but that shape also allows for daylighting and natural ventilation and all of the units. Um, views was a really important thing. It's right on the waterfront. So there's a lot of interesting things that come together. Um, and you know, when you talk about integrated design, not only to meet uh, people's goals, but to meet the env environmental goals, these types of examples are really powerful. Next slide. And the thing that makes them even more powerful is that they're actually real. Um, and you know, students care about sustainability, but if they don't believe that meaningful change is both accessible and exciting, then they'll be jaded. So like, they, they can go out and like see, you know, see these real projects, and uh, and understand and understand that that it's you know, it's it's attainable to to do these to to make these sorts of changes. So next slide. But not everybody can be a rock star, um, and uh, but you can you can sort of but there are rock stars in your local community uh, or your or your network of uh, of either academic or uh, or industry partners um, that you could that you can use and connect to your students. So this is an example of, uh, of someone within the Autodesk network that is doing really great things that we've uh, I've used as examples to, to, to some student groups. Uh, this is a, the BioLite Stove project. And you know this is a, a great example because it's a company that's doing great things, creating cool products, and you, and you can also use this, you know, there's, there's technical rigor behind this as well, right? So there, you can use this as a way of teaching heat transfer and fluid flow, but then also connect it back to the engineers and the business people behind it that are you know, basically being agents of positive change in the world. Um, so this is a camping stove, that they, and they also have an, a model for the developing world that uh, reduces carbon, uh, carbon emission, or not, not carbon emissions, but um, black carbon emissions um, by 98%. So, uh, three billion people in the world cook with biomass. So this is a, a huge potential impact. Um, next slide. And uh, I think perhaps the most important role models are to your younger st students are older students. Um, these people are Im immediately approachable um, and they can help inspire and mentor, mentor your younger students. And we're going to hear a lot more about this from uh, from the students from Rome. And this is actually a, a picture of them. Um, and and they're doing really amazing things too. So next slide. This is one of the projects from the uh, Rome students. And the third step here is to activate them. Uh, next slide. So once you've inspired them to do great things and, and shown them some examples of people doing great things, set them loose and let them do it. There's nothing more powerful than the human will and spirit when it's passionately applied to a problem. Um, this is a group of students from Olin College. Uh, it's an engineering school in, uh, in Massachusetts that has a, a different model for education. Everything's project-based learning. Um, so this is a, a design studio in which they were learning about uh, kinematics, but, all, but through biomimicry. So they're looking at how grasshoppers hop to make their own hoppers, and then build and compete that, uh, with those things. And so the key here is that the educators are providing support and motivation, but they're not holding the student's hand. Um, and they're giving the students the enough of the tools and enough of the knowledge to, to get started, um, but then sort of letting students apply and integrate that knowledge on their own. And the outcomes just blow your mind whenever you look at a, a resume from students from Olin College. I mean, just as someone who's making hiring decisions, it's like those students are far above and beyond most other students that I see because they're they're thrown into the deep end and they, they're, they're just, cre they create amazing things just in their schoolwork. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a, a story of the decathlon house, and this is you know basically a group of students built this house in their spare time. Uh, I mean, look at it; it's beautiful. It's amazing. Uh, this is a it's a it's a two-year commitment um, for students, and there's interdisciplinary teams of folks from architecture, structural engineering, building, uh, building science, mechanical, electrical, plumbing. You know, people that have these different sorts of of, uh, of niches all coming together to create this multidisciplinary um, project and. Uh, you know, the Solar Week Half Line, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, it's, it's sort of the, as Glenn said, the, the Cadillac of competitions, but there's no shortage of other competitions that aren't, you know, maybe aren't quite as uh, big of a commitment. But this kind of thing where students are able to um, uh, work in teams with other students and really apply knowledge in ways that, are pa that they're passionate about. Um, and then, uh, I'm just gonna next slide. The so the Rome students, um, from from what I've seen in education these days, are doing some of the most interesting, uh, powerful work, and in just in terms of activating uh, students within a studio environment. So just looking forward to hearing from those guys. Next slide. Um, my last closing point here is that Autodesk can help you, support you in this journey. Um, Glenn's going to talk at the end of the presentation about some of the tools and resources that we have. Um, I want I want to conclude next slide. I want to conclude my, my bit here by talking about one of the projects that Glenn and I are working on together. Um, it's an Autodesk Green Building Certificate Program, and so it's a, it's a self self paced online learning for students. Um, and the the thing that's really exciting about this is it's sort of a new way of uh, students acquiring and proving some of that, some of their knowledge online. So, if you're, we're, we're sort of designing it to help uh, solar decathlon teams, for example. If they're, you know, a lot of them come into this knowing that they want to learn a lot, but not necessarily knowing all that they should learn to create integrated design. So, uh, we're all of this uh, body of knowledge that we're creating uh, is anchored to the design process. It focuses on design fundamentals and design goals like thermal comfort, visual comfort, uh, airflow, energy use, um, and is meant to really be a resource for students that are doing these kinds of applied projects. Um, and so all the resources are available to those sorts of teams, but there's also an additional mechanism whereby you can sort of uh, take a series of online tests and exercises to sort of prove that you are uh, not only know the fundamentals of green design, but can, all, can use uh, interdisciplinary workflows uh, with some Autodesk tools to test and uh, optimize that, your design. So um, that's all I had to present to you all uh, right now, but I look forward to your questions and, and future interaction. Great. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Okay, so what we're going to do is actually shift over a little bit right now and actually bring the students from Rome online. They're actually kind of hanging out there. Thank you to them for being staying up through the evening there. So, um, Giuseppe, can you guys go ahead and activate your camera? Yeah. Hi. Okay, so let's go ahead and introduce these guys. It's a fantastic group. Uh, we have Giuseppe and Matteo, and actually I don't think we have Ricardo today. We have a stand-in as well as their professor, and we'll go ahead and have them introduce themselves, but just by way of like uh, thinking about what they're up to, they are doing really what I think is one of the most innovative design studio experiences I've seen, where they really have everything from the very first year design students working with the seniors and all the levels in between, and people from industry to really tackle some real world problems, and they're going to show you what they did as first year students here in just a moment. But they're really, I think, at the leading edge of sort of a very innovative studio experience. That's why I want to share it with you. Because I think, you know, it's, it's really amongst the best things I see as a design studio experience. So guys, why don't you go ahead and take over and we will like, uh, try to follow along. So I'm looking at your smiling faces both in person and on the slide screen now. Okay. Hi, hello. I'm Giuseppe, and uh, the third line represents uh, a picture of, uh, we can say, the other uh, students, uh, which, next slide, with uh, Professor Andrew Giuseppe Model held uh, in the first year of the uh, University of La Sapienza, 
uh, the course of uh, computer science and uh, automatic uh, design in which we told to the young students of the first year the use of uh, Revit and so the logic of uh, the building information modeling. So, next slide. We turned to a classroom of about uh, 150 students. And uh, next slide. We set up a studio work group based on uh, older students that uh, are uh, the, the tutors. So, me, Ricardo, Matteo, and uh, the young students too, who as uh, volunteers uh, give uh, their uh, free time uh, to collaborate uh, and help us in a real world. So, next slide, the team of today will, uh, will, uh, is about uh, um, real competition, uh, design contest in uh, Bolzano, in Northern Italy, of a nursery school uh, in which uh, we bring uh, our knowledge uh, has uh, whole students with uh, young students to reach uh, this, uh, this goal of uh, design uh, um, sustainable uh, nursery school. So, so Giuseppe, just real quickly, as we're looking at this image, are these all examples of things that the first year students were creating or like a... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a, 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 a work that uh, brings uh, uh, not only our uh, knowledge but the help of uh, the students of the first year. Uh, so uh, there is a genuine competition in which uh, we, uh, we link ourselves with uh, uh, the young students. We set up, in fact, a team of uh, seven people three old students and three young students that uh, next slide okay uh, is, uh, is uh, organized with the older students that help the young students to improve their knowledge and so share our uh, experience next slide always uh, hearing uh, the um, ideas uh, from uh, the young because uh, they are more uh, free from uh, any technological and uh, structural uh, um, problem. And so they can help us to uh, see uh, ahead and uh, work with more fantasy. Ah, so, so, so you're saying that really the first year students, because they are not yet, you know, what is it, yeah. narrowed by the, the reality of the constraints, they think more fancifully and more creatively? Yeah, they are, uh, they are kind of virgin, okay, uh, that uh, are free from uh, any uh, other, um, uh, yes, uh, any, any other ideas of uh, or problems such as uh, structural or mechanical uh, way uh, to, to design so the, the project. Okay. So this is, uh, I, I think, that uh, a great way to work closely in uh, relationship with uh, the young ideas. So in the next slide, in the other slide, we uh, organize uh, all this team divided in teams and pairs that uh, work together uh, in order to uh, stimulate each other and motivate each other. So in the next slide, we can see that uh, we um, work always uh, looking to structural problems, to sustainable problems, uh, but also um, uh, linking uh, the real work to uh, the, the contest too. So it's a uh, work with uh, all disciplines that work together. In the next slide, we can see the, the process. So uh, the way that uh, we uh, we develop the, the design. And in this diagram, in fact, we can uh, see uh, uh, the pieces that uh, bring uh, the design to reach uh, the, system, the construction uh, possibility. So we have an aesthetic phase uh, to preliminary to definitive until the building uh, phase. And so here we, we use it and share this uh, with the young students as a guide in order to, uh, to keep 
the goal and the 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 line know. So in the next slide, we can see that in the in this contest, our attention is paid on the method design and the preliminary planning. And so we talk with to the young students the way to work and the tools to to have um, to be reviewed. So in Revit, uh, we understand that uh, we can create matches and then uh, create different proposals and then work uh, with it uh, in order to uh, understand the best uh, solution uh, about the skill distribution and so the space is, but also to understand the problems linked with uh, all that is uh, the energetic uh, problems. So, so Giuseppe, one thing that's kind of interesting about this is it seems that even at the first year, you're having them start to address how it's going to be built, what it's going to cost, and it's not just the form and the idea, but it's the reality behind how it's actually going to be delivered? Yeah, uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's the first fact that uh, they contact with all these problems, and also with the uh, right uh, and the way to work with it, we can uh, um, can uh, show them all these problems that they have uh, have never uh, uh, keep in touch. So uh, in the next slide, we will start and uh, to show the process that uh, we have to keep uh, this uh, to uh, to work. So. The first step is to create an analogical, so with pencil and paper, uh, sketches of uh, the design too, only with the young students. Next, we uh, develop and create different proposals, uh, divided uh, so the team will pay in pairs into four. Each one uh, proposed a uh, uh, preliminary uh, form, and then, next slide, we synthesize it into uh, only one, yeah. all the best uh, ideas and uh, uh, solutions into the into, uh, only one. And so we started to analyze it, for example, about ventilation strategies, with the wind of the summer and the winter, in order to analyze and uh, to study, the, for example, the courtyard and the way uh, he worked with the country, with the design too, but also about the solar radiation uh, impact, for example, the roof, and, uh, and so we analyze how much the energy can improve our sustainability, the sustainability of the design tool, but also the fatigue, and so how, uh, how uh, the light and the sun energy impact the design. So, next slide, we brought this uh, roof uh, design into a more definitive one, in which uh, we uh, share how I know that jazz uh, all the students so with chakra, structural or technological problems to the young students. And so we can uh, uh, develop this, uh, this uh, design in, uh, uh, in all the aspects and uh, all the disciplines. Next slide. The uh, importance uh, of uh, the delight and so always uh, with the sustainable uh, uh, strategies. Uh, and so we analyze the work and the plan and the, um, the design about the impact of, uh, the, of the shadows and the light in the different period uh, of the year, too. Next slide. We change it and also passes from the um, uh, from the time to also more realistic uh, uh, rendering in order to uh, show the result of the building and the, you can say the possibility to um, to leave these uh, spaces and so from interior to exterior. Uh, so next slide. And uh, next slide to the exterior one. 
So the way the, the time is linked in the context, and also the way the student can use the Korea, for example. Next slide. This is uh, so the uh, complex uh, work. All the keeping uh, only 10 days, uh, all, always uh, uh, in touch with the young students. Next slide. So uh, the, about the conclusion, because uh, we have seen the process, the people, and the product of this, uh, of this way to work. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, the important uh, uh, thing is to uh, treat students not like uh, novices, but as professionals, because uh, with their views and with their genuine uh, way to keep in touch with this problem, they can uh, help us as a member of a, a, a world group but also in, uh, can help uh, the industry. So in the next slide, I think that another uh, important aspect is uh, to invest in, uh, in uh, these young students because uh, they are, uh, um, they, they, are uh, they want to improve the knowledge and so motivating them, stimulating them, it could be uh, useful for us but also for the real world. So next slide. Don't worry about uh, the way to find them because uh, if uh, uh, there is a real pro uh, project uh, to be brought or uh, other uh, works, they uh, want to uh, spend the extra time and, uh, um, and uh, strength, we can say, to uh, put the knowledge and up the, the, the project the uh, same um, too. So in the next slide, the, also the possibility to keep in touch with uh, a small group from a large group to a small group is natural, is natural because uh, uh, who wants to help the, this, uh, this work is, um, is someone that, can, that uh, is stimulating, uh, uh, motivated to work with uh, and collaborate with uh, the other people. So don't worry uh, about also, next slide, the time to, uh, to reach the, this result because all that, is, uh, that we have shown in this day is uh, created in just one year. So um, also the time is not a problem because uh, with uh, real uh, product, real uh, intention, and so the relationship between the university and the school uh, can, can help also this uh, project too. So next slide. If you want to work, uh, to, we can say, uh, see our results and our uh, research in the time, Keep in touch with uh, with us uh, in the website in which we will uh, show all the projects of uh, the young students and help and uh, helping the faculty and uh, and also the real project that uh, we, we wish to 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 do in uh, in time. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Giuseppe. And thank you to your professor and you really for sharing your incredible story. I hope you sort of agree. That's like I'm just stupefied by what they've been able to accomplish. I'm, I'm so impressed with these young guys and the professor's work. You know, if you're looking for faculty members to join yourselves sometime soon, keep track of these guys because like this dedication to teaching and this commitment to really making sure all the young students get mentored and kind of brought up. You know, I think these guys are really, really exceptional. So so thank you for joining us. So hang tight on the line. We're going to keep you around for Q&A if you can. And we will shift gears on this side to Uta Porska, one of our local experts here who I've had the pleasure of working with uh, here at Penn State on a couple of classes. My turn? Your okay. turn. It's all, the stage is all yours. OK. I have you 10 more slides or so. I hope you have time for a discussion afterwards, uh, too. I want to talk about a seminar that I taught last semester for the first time, uh, Designing with Climate Tools. Um, 
The session is about best practices. I'm not sure if this is already best practice. This was first practice. Um, and maybe we can discuss, uh, or I hope we can discuss later, um, what next steps would be when um, I redo this course next semester. Um, I want to show you here, I want to focus on some tools that we used um, in the seminar. Um, so the idea was to use these climate tools to design uh, a single family house um, and to learn how, what can these tools tell us um, for the design and the design process. Um, on the first, the course it's a three credit seminar, uh, we met once a week um, for 15 weeks. On the first uh, meeting, um, we used a little um, tool called Solar Shoebox. Um, and I show this, um, and I wanted to use this, and I think it is very successful, um, because this little program, so that's the entire program, um, it introduces uh, main um, methods of um, environmentally conscious design. So um, you have to pick a climate where your design is. Um, you need to think of orientation of your little building, insulation, about window size, window orientation, glazing type, thermal mass, do you have a heavy building or a light building, uh, shading, um, very important for environmentally conscious design, and also ventilation. Um, structure type, um, is it a heavy structure or a light structure? Um, the idea of this program is what you see on the right side here, this upper bar here, this is the outer climate, um, this is State College here, I think, um, you see here the blue means it's too cold, um, the green means it's comfortable, red means it's too hot. Um, the lower bar here is um, the climate inside. And um, this, the program is more or less a, a, a game, so to say, um, that you play with these parameters um, so long that you get here the bar here as green as possible. Um, to give you here an example of one student showed this really nicely, Caitlin Rowe. Um, she um, made in this box here, you see here, it's full of glazing on all sides. Um, and this is here another little caricature <laughs> of a little building with one big window to the south um, with a shading on top of it. Here you see no shading. And you see what happens in this computer game, if you will. Um, everything's too red, uh, too much red. Even in winter, um, it has overheating um, in this little building here. On this side here, uh, Caitlin achieved to get most of the, um, throughout the year, a comfortable climate inside um, by manipulating orientation, window size, ventilation, um, shading, and so on. Um, this is a program that you can learn in 10 minutes. And after this first session, you get immediately print main concepts. And this is why um, I like um, this program. Um, afterwards, um, students, so in the solar shoe box, you cannot design anything. You just have the box and change the, change the parameters. Can you bring a lot of it? No. no. I have the box and you can squeeze it and you can put a window in there. So you cannot um, um, upload a model in there. Um, students then uh, started designing uh, their little single family house. The idea was to keep the, the design really small um, so that we have enough time to look into different programs. Um, so uh, they designed a single family house. Uh, this is your one example with sketches. Um, students did this in Vasari, um, also in, uh, in, in uh, Revit. Um, when they had, that's more or less here, second or third week already, we jumped into Bazari. Um, the, pro, uh, the, the site was in State College, um, very close by. Students could take a look at the site, um, and you see here a little the, um, design sketch in Bazari. Um, and what we then did was uh, doing an energy analysis in Bazari. Um, and these are here. Um, some outputs of Vasari, not the most, um, they are fancier ones, but I think these are the ones that are the most useful. They show you here, um, that's a, an important number here, they show you the energy use per square foot, 
and we came back to this uh, throughout the semester. Um, it shows you here where you lose um, energy in your building. So this red bar here, for example, um, means heat loss through the windows. Um, that's here. So you see here that you lose a lot of uh, heat through windows. Um, this is here um, the cooling load. And again, here this orange bar here um, is solar heat gain. So by, by interpreting um, such uh, diagrams, um, students then afterwards modified their designs um, and, and in an iterative uh, process uh, try to optimize their designs. Point I want to make here is you get very easy um, output, but if you don't discuss what this means, um, it doesn't do anything. So for example here, the 63 um, kilo BTU per square foot per year. If this is not put into context, students do not understand what this means. And a thing that we then did was to make sense of these numbers is we started a table, um, more or less in the first third, I would say fifth or sixth week of the semester, where we have here all designs of all students. Um, that's, by the way, a third. It starts from third year, um, fourth year, fifth year students, and graduate students. Um, we looked here at what's the average um, energy use in a single family house uh, in the US. It's 44 kilo BTU per square foot per year. So when you think of the last slide with the 63, you, you see that there's already actually a, a, a number that is, was very high. Um, this number here that is not visible, I think it says 18. Um, the um, 2030 challenge to the energy use that we want to achieve by 2030 is 18 kilo BTU per square foot per year. Um, and when you look at what this, where the students after the Vasari assignment came up with, um, they actually became again sort of a game. And I think that's the good thing of simulation tools that to start um, playing and trying to, mani to manipulate your uh, models so that you get uh, better numbers. So this is as low as they could get with Vizari, which is a critique that I would have at Vizari, um, that you can never reach here these 18 kilo BTU per square foot. Um, and we discussed a lot why this happens if Vizari is in, uh, a program for environmentally conscious design that we can actually not get the numbers down to zero energy. And that's at least part of the program. It just won't let you get down that far. Yes. So, for example, um, the uh, highest R value that you can enter there is R21, I think. Um, passive house walls have R60. The German pavilion at the Solar Decathlon had R100. So, with the R21, you cannot come very far. For me, the good thing was students all of, all of a sudden, they learned already what an R20 is, but they didn't, well, they were not really interested. And all of a sudden, they wanted to get this number, a different number. So this learning process, um, I think that was uh, the good experience of that. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, I'm interested in that, that number, but I guess in going through this process, were they able, even though they could never get that number, they able to have their design be responsive to try to get the number down and, and making mm -hmm. good design choices as opposed to just good energy choices. Yeah. Um, come back to that. To that. Uh, show, I'll show a few more slides now. Um, after that, Vizari, we went to Ecotech um, where we did some lighting studies. Um, so on the left side, you see direct uh, sunlight. Uh, studies. Um, the upper image is the steep summer sun, the lower image is the flat winter sun. So um, idea is to keep the summer sun out to let the winter sun in. And on the right you see daylight studies, daylight factor studies, and the luminance factor studies. Uh, a student project here as an example. Um, on the left side, again, uh, the winter sun coming deep into the building. On the right, the steep summer sun with a louver system that keeps um, the, the summer sun out. 
um, and this is a typical um, Ecotech model. So dealing with these different models, a Vizari model, an Ecotech model, a Revit model, there was a challenge too and how to, do you draw these again or do you, can you um, import them? We had a lot of challenges with that. Um, that's an example here of the Illuminant studies. Um, we talked, of course, again, um, you get these images very quickly, but if you don't talk about um, how much is a 50-foot candle or what's a good daylight factor, um, it's just a good image and nothing else. Um, so we were really looking into what is a good number for a bedroom, uh, for example, um, for, for other housing. Um, for kitchens and so on. Another example um, of a project uh, on the left side you see again the direct uh, sun studies um, and on the right you see um, an illuminance, a daylight factor study um, for the different spaces uh, in the rooms. Um, another example, this right on the upper uh, so, uh, part of the slide, this is again an Ecotech uh, study. We used a little other program here uh, called DFCalc to compare what we got out of Ecotech. Um, and does this, um, yeah, can we, can we, are these numbers really um, valuable? Um, and uh, this is a little, just a very little program where you can enter one window and then look at uh, the uh, illuminance uh, level. Um, and this room here, for example, represents this room here. Um, and we found that um, the numbers are very similar. Um, and I did this so that there's an additional learning effect for the students, that they know again that we can talk about what is an illuminance level, um, what do you get out from Ecotech. Do you get this also uh, from, from different programs too? As a next step then, uh, the students drew by hand um, or in the computer uh, wall sections of their single family house. You see here uh, a couple of them. Um, and then in the next step, uh, we entered uh, the different layers of the wall sections in Ecotech. Um, so you see here the wall section um, and here uh, the main wall um, layers. Um, and we, we did this um, to calculate an R value. So in Vizari, you cannot enter an R value. You pick a wall system. Um, and in this case, in Ecotech, you could get much more specific, um, have your own um, wall assembly. Um, so this would be here uh, the model um, in Ecotech. And each surface then um, is uh, connected to one of the walls that you create in Ecotech. And then you do your calculations, and you get something very similar to Vizari um, that looks um, more or less like this here that tells you, here's the, a zero line. Everything that's below the zero line tells you you lose heat. Um, everything that's above it, you gain heat. Um, and you see here this red bar here um, is the heat loss, I think, through the windows again. Um, and you see how much. So very, very similar, you can directly compare this with Vasari, but with your own wall assemblies. That's the difference. Um, and as an example here, just a very quick example, um, on this upper chart here, uh, you see a double pane glazing for um, this little um, box here. Um, and you see here how much energy goes uh, through the windows. Um, and this would be here, triple pane glazing. And you see here um, how much energy or how lesser energy you lose through through the windows. Um, you are you able to define excuse me, are you able to define air tightness? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um yes, I think that's my last slide here. Um, a few outcomes of, of these houses. Um, in the seminar we didn't have from my point of view, once a week, we don't have enough time to talk about design. Um, that's one big issue. Um, so um, trying to control the program, sometimes the programs controlled us and not we the programs. Um, and so I think through um, um, 
teaching this again, um, when students get more familiar with it, um, I hope that we also improve design quality um, and yeah, get more familiar also with these numbers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let me go ahead. I'm just going to give you a, a little more information before we actually like uh, start the discussion part because there's a little stuff I wanted to share with you in terms of resources and some of the stuff that's available to you. So let me kind of go pop over there for just a sec. There it is. And play the slideshow. And actually, for anyone who, I'm going to give you a bunch of URLs and pointers to information. And if anyone who wants this stuff, actually, if we could start a list, that'd be fantastic of email addresses or something like that, some way to connect it so I can give you all these slides and everything and you can get pointers to where all this stuff goes. And of course, I shouldn't have started back over here, but let me get back out to where I want to be. As much as we like seeing Adam again, we're going to go all the way down to. Well, that's what I'm going to be right Okay. Well, no worries. Well, maybe we should turn open for that because in the slides, I'll just tell you what you can receive in the slide and we go from there. In terms of resources, it's just going to point you to where you can go to download any of the things that are part of the Autodesk software to get access to that for free software for yourself and for your students, as well as how to get into some of these simulation services as part of cloud services. So there's a site we're going to send you to there. There's like a site for getting all the Project Sorry stuff. So if you want to start playing around with those wind uh, tunnel analyses or the solar radiation analyses, there's a site for downloading that. There's a sustainability workshop, and that is the one that Adam was referring to. That's the one where we have a lot of videos talking about strategies and overall approaches to things, a lot of good reference materials on the sustainability, okay, and just like uh, overall design strategies that aren't necessarily software specific. And then we're also going to point you towards, there's a BIM curriculum. And that's something that I actually worked on with my students at Stanford, where there are a number of lessons out there. For example, in daylighting, there's all these lessons that have these five-minute videos that show you how to use the tool, have data sets that you can use to start exploring these concepts, like the amount of daylighting on the floor, or how the light is bouncing off the shelves, things like that. There are assessment questions, uh, key concepts. The idea was it was really designed as kind of an integrated, sort of a, a modular thing where you could pick up different modules that were interesting to you, have a ready-made data set and a video you could point your students towards, and then just take it off as a part of a point of departure for incorporating it into your own class. So there's really a whole curriculum out there about a lot of BIM concepts, and in particular, there's two units that are all about performance-based design using Vasari and sustainable design, so <laughs> water, power, daylighting, passive design, issues like that, and how you can start to bring those into your classroom with, again, data sets and examples to help you get started. In terms of how to go from here, or where to go from here, the idea is really more than anything, we want you to like just be thinking about how you can apply all these things. It's all kind of great stories, but if we don't actually do something with it, there's not a whole lot of point. So different things you can do right away are to register to be part of the Autodesk uh, education community, and at students.autodesk.com you can do that. You know, download the software so you and your students can start playing with it. You know, apply the knowledge that's available out there in the workshops so that, uh, you know, see if we could actually use some of that and kind of spread it. Or even if you have fantastic examples you're working on in class, I'm very interested because that's what I do. I do the curriculum development sides of these and pulling those things back together. So if you're working on a project that's really particularly interesting that it might be a good one to share, I want to talk to you about, like, uh, data sets and things that we could use and then share with other faculty members you know, throughout the world. Okay, There's a whole student expert program. If you have some fantastic students, and we all do, those one or two or three who really shine, they're always at the front of the room asking questions and they stay afterwards to really figure out how this works. We want to know about these people because we're creating just a whole league of student experts to support each other, to come to Autodesk in the summer and receive extra training on all the tools so they can go back to your schools and actually support the other students at your schools. So kind of an elite group, but I think that's a really kind of successful thing we've done in some of the schools and we're trying to spread that much more broadly now. Finally, Adam in particular is interested in this whole notion of beta testing, that whole eco-design certificate, that self-paced learning path where students can go through and work towards a certificate and just do a more of a modular learning approach. If you're interested in sort of participating in that or have some students who'd like to, we are very keen to kind of hear from you. And I actually, yeah, when we 
get your email address if you're keen on that. Either send it directly to Adam or kind of put a notation on there and we'll do that. So that's kind of it in terms of the whole presentation side of it. Let's go ahead and just like, you know, you know, talk about what's going on. I know we're sort of at the end of our time, so if you need to, please feel free to get up. No one's going to be offended if you uh, get up and run, but if you can stick around and talk informally even, you know, let's take advantage of it. We still have our Rome students online. We have Adam online. Una's still here. Yeah, if anyone would like to talk about how these things apply and ask questions, let's go for it. So like, you know, in the room, if you see all these different tools and you see what Uda's doing, I know there's some specific things about transferring models from here to here and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, are there some specific things you want to talk about or more general approaches or? Oh, I've got that kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, I think that the whole idea of Autodesk crap, like, oh, sure. what's interesting is when we're working between multiple programs, not all of which are Autodesk, oh, exactly. how do we, was on learning the tools, sure. and I'm not sure if I want to do this again. <laughs> so, because um, I have an interesting thought. So, when I was in graduate school, I studied training um, and the MBA, and he did a CD course, which was a marketing course, where he invited the class of teams, and he gave the class of training and building. And he said, This team's doing it right, and this team's doing it boss. But I always wanted to take that approach to this. Like, you just give a sketch of a couple boxes. Say this team does it with this wall today. This team starts with this wall today. Now start to now start to make changes based on information that gets you start to take it's designing, but it's more simple, it's more simplified. I think your approach is amazing. Whether you think that would work with your type of course or how you want to see it. I think um, Having directed beginning in the third and fourth week in the Kinsley design, well, we don't talk um, about introducing the new program or so, but having uh, students present their designs and then talk about the designs um, at a relatively early stage, but hopefully help um, that they have better designs. Um, so the first, we, we only did one design review, and this was in the middle of the semester, um, seven week or so, um, and this was too late. Um, and I, I also didn't want the students to change it then, because there were so many things to do, <laughs> right, um, or in front of us that we, um, um, and at the end, I wanted to use actually two more programs, and um, I, I let it go, so because we, Maybe I underestimated the iterative process. So I thought if we have two weeks of Bizarre, we are fine, and then we have three weeks of Bibu Tech, and then we're fine. Um, but uh, there were two things. One was the challenge of the program, and the second was understanding what these numbers mean. Um, and I can introduce this, um, but and then the students do it, but then they do it wrong. And then you have to come back and you need to talk about it. Um, and um, so it's not this one circle that you explain it and then they do it and then you do the next. It is, um, yeah, showing or, or co also comparing. I think this was really successful. When we compared what are the different numbers. At the beginning, really, if it was 60 kilo, you can do a 20 or if you have an R value of 20 or 40 or 60, 
didn't mean anything. And um, the students, they took the course because they, they wanted to design zero energy, actually mainly they wanted all the design single, single family houses, and low energy single family houses. But our, I think our Pennsylvania, our Pennsylvania students, they think so of the parents and their family and designing for it. Um, um, in this world context, um, small houses. And so they were particularly interested also in this topic of the small building. And they, they wanted to understand that in these numbers. So, and I, I think when, when they started comparing um, and they started adding a few inches more insulation and, <laughs> um, and then started, oh, what is your number, what is my number, it's still 10 kilometers to move on, and yours, don't believe that. And, um, then it became, um, I, I said game at the beginning, and this might not look, sound good for a year, but I actually think um, it became a little um, a game, and I thought this was some, a good learning. Um, yeah. I think games go to think about it because that actually motivates people. It's a, I think it's actually it, it plays out very good. Actually, if I can add just very briefly to what we did say, it's like a, I'm going to take off my Autodesk hat and put on my Stanford hat now. And then, yeah. and then in terms of there is this thing about separating the understanding of the design discipline from the tools, and it's really really useful to do that because with all these tools, especially if we do it a number of different tools, it is so easy to get lost in the complexity of the tools and. You get all the pretty graphics and the charts, and you have no idea what they mean, but my chart looks really good. And it takes time to really do those two or three iterations to unpack and really understand and kind of complete the loop. So for anyone going after this, yeah, you know, it really, it, the, the flow just really isn't smooth enough that you can do one, two, three, and just kind of get really quickly between them. I think it really is much better to focus on a few. Like I thought what you do do it a, Contrasting the result of Asari to Ecotech was very good because you got some validation and comparison in there and you could sort of see what was going on. But yeah, I spent a lot of time working with faculty at a lot of schools, just getting models moving around back and forth. And there's always ways, but it also takes some real hoop jumping. It's just not a very smooth process yet. Now, this is Adam. I have one additional point to add to, to that. Sure. Um, just so. <laughs> This is exa exactly the same sort of feedback that I've been hearing from uh, sort of educators since I started this this gig at Autodesk, and that's a lot of the feedback that um, we're pulling forward into this um, uh, Green Building Certificate Program. Uh, we've got, you know, focusing a lot on what's the fundamental physics and science and math behind the analysis so that people understand the numbers, understand our values, and not just our values, but, you know, what, what's our value in series versus parallel and understanding how, how that stuff connects to the design process and to the software so that when you're looking at the buttons in the software, you actually have a reference that, that goes right back to the science. And then when you're looking at the software, um, being really rigorous, as Udo was saying, like it's it's you know you can go in Vasari and in li literally less than like two minutes you can have an energy analysis result, but it doesn't do you any good unless you understand what is behind the simulation as well as what to do with um, how to analyze it because simulation and analysis are different you have to analyze the simulation and so that's a big focus of what we're trying to do um, with this body knowledge just being really really um, explicit about that process so that it is something that students understand and that they can un like apply rigorously to an iterative iterative design process and if i can put one oh, more um, parameter on so when I see what you're doing, I can imagine bringing in some of uh, my local contractors who do like very, you know, great uh, buildings and say, okay, I'm going to put you on each team, but you're going to say why this one would never actually fly because, you know, it may actually that would work. Because I think we can model all these things perfectly in the virtual, and then when we go out into the field, contractors are like, well, we're still going to do it the way we do it. So okay. I'm sort of curious about that next level of feedback around the process. Like I, I would love to see a class like that because I think that really is the enlightened way. It's almost kind of like what the Rome students are trying to do in terms of really making, nothing is in the abstract. So making the perfect abstract thermal construct 
if no one's going to build it that way, is really just this exercise and you know, it's, it's very academic, but it's not very practical. So for a student standpoint, to actually hear that, well, you know, an R value of 100 may increase your energy savings by a small amount, but if it's going to cost us five times as much to build it, I want that to enter into, some appreciation of that to enter into it too, because I think really that level of reality makes it much more meaningful for the students. I think it would be very interesting to take a sort of cap on houses and put them in the side to see what some of those models because you can actually pay them now as a real model. Yeah. Actually, Adam, do you know, have any of the solar decathlon houses, do we have any of the models for them? Any of the energy models? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I know a lot of them did use our uh, modeling and analysis tools, but I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen any. Okay, no, it's, it's interesting because, you know, to your point, this whole thing, you know, we know that generally energy modeling software is off by, you know, at Stanford, in the, the research studies will show it's off by like 200%. Just systematically, if you're if you're off by like you know a factor of two, you're doing pretty good, and that's because all the modeling is done on these fantastic optimistic assumptions about you know what the hours of use are going to be, and that no one's ever going to leave a window hanging open or prop the door or anything. But yeah, you know, they do know, and there's yeah, you know, it's it's actually fairly consistently off, you know, for whatever good that is. But yeah, you know, even the best ones, if you start track them historically, are about that far off. So this whole notion of Really, I think the way we often I approach it in classes is to say that, hey, yeah, there's none of this that's absolute. It's all comparative. Because at least, yeah, I can say that given this wall construction or this type of orientation, given the same set of bad assumptions about how people are using the building, it, it'll be consistent and comparative, if not absolute. And that's a, that's a very tricky one, because that's one thing I really hate about what Vasari does. It tells you that over 30 years, it's going to be one million seven hundred eighty-two six hundred thirty-five dollars and forty-three cents, and like you know, I'm going to win the Nobel Prize before that comes true. It's just it's, it's just it's just a not a valid number. So Based on yeah, it's just the models just aren't that accurate. So I I always sort of hate where tools give you this this false impression of accuracy, you know, because that, that that really is doing service uh, students a big disservice to kind of uh, even pretend that we can do it at that level. Because then it, it gets you down to playing with the number as opposed to understanding the principle and developing your intuition. You know, and that's, you know, but gaming, kind of, you know, I think gaming is useful because there is this funny little competitive nature. And I think students, you know, it's, it's good. What I think gaming is actually really interesting for, for, for a lot of educational reasons, including the, not to get the same city type thing, but when a person is able to plug in a number and see that feedback loop, then they just change a simple variable. And usually you change that variable by a lot. Yeah. To see that the amplitude of which are changing, that's a very, very uh, important educational experience to me. Okay. Teaching a concept. Actually, I'm really curious you know, with your students. I have this problem with mine where, you, okay, we're going to play with the numbers. So how do you get them to do, it's this thing where let's isolate the variables. Okay, you got the model. Don't go in and change 15 different things at once to gain the number but have a totally ununderstandable, unpredictable result. Like, do you give any guidance about that in terms of, like, because there is sort of a, optimization is its own funny process. And I don't think we ever really talked about it very explicitly about a good strategy for it. Um, I, I would like to add one thing oh, to please. gaming, yeah. um, and this is what I like with the gaming is that, so this first this first program that I use, it, it already provides you with a certain complexity. So you have different parameters that you can change, and it is not what you said at the beginning, how we went to school, the steady approach yeah. that we first learned, you know, this, and if you go through the wall, and so they, they, if you play with different things, and this is like how design is, and you get your program and your site and everything at the same time, and then you're somehow overwhelmed, and then you try to work through this, and um, this is, I think, how, how programs work too, um, and this is why I also think this. Um, also with this first program, um, it's only this box, and you could say, students actually ask the same thing, I want to import my, my design now, but um, I, I think the idea of this program is that you really squeeze, you, you can just change the, the, the proportion of your building and then run the simulation that takes 30 seconds. And so you can, you can change only one parameter and 
then we click it all the time and simulate, simulate, and then we get really a series out of, uh, out of it. With Vasari, it's more clicking through everything to do the optimum. Yeah. Um, and then you get somehow a super number. Yeah. And then uh, you start discussing if you have an R value of 100. You know that you have to draw a wall section later, um, and you have to calculate your R value. Um, let's see if you really want this in three weeks when you when you design your wall or something. Um, so it is again this uh, process then of reflecting. Um, so in, in particular, in design you can optimize very quickly uh, by clicking. Uh, a mechanical system that's really efficient, right? You have no clue what this means. Yeah. Um, and so that there's, for, for example, my limitation where I think here the mechanical engineer must come in and must tell me what series 70 means. <laughs> um, so, so, what would we have to do to read that? I want to use radians, uh, light can, and um, and um, the design them. Um, what then developed in California design them? Do you know the design better? I don't know that one up here. No. So that's again for thermal um, Unfortunately, maybe we cannot talk about this, but the tech has not been further developed for the last years. Um, and the final analysis with people take is somewhat a bit painful, adding all these layers uh, of the assembly and then calculating the R values. Ecotech is wonderful for all lighting studies, um, and I don't know. If Actually, let, let, let me comment a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. So, with Ecotech, and Ecotech, yeah, there's, there's no further development going on right now on that one at this point. Okay, we'll see what happens in the future. What's happening to the R value stuff? That I do know. Actually, within Revit, they actually moved it back into the modeling environment. So now, when you construct a wall assembly, each of the different materials is understand to have different thermal properties. So it's actually gotten quite smart. If you change the thickness of the uh, insulation layer from three to six, the R value of the wall then changes, and then Green Building Studio or Vasari will do the right thing. And it's the same engine underneath it. So that's what's happened to the thermal stuff. Daylighting, I'm waiting to see what happens because yeah, that's one of the last things that Ecotech is really good at that the other tools don't do yet. The SARI doesn't do a good job with it. You can do some of it in 3ds Max, but it's harder to do as far as I'm concerned there. But you know, as, as far as I can tell, all of the different pieces are ultimately being modularized and they're starting to show up in the analysis root tabs of the other tools. That seems to be what happened to wind and uh, you know, uh, solar and all these other things. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure which, you know, I don't think anything will ever go away completely. It may show up under a different umbrella, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to ask this question. It's a word that's come up in many of the um, conference and panels up to now. It's the word intuition. It's come up several times here. Mm -hmm. um, in two lovely presentations done by a, an architect who teaches structures, he, he showed two exercises he did in, in, in the students um, designing around the structural principle of flexure. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, what he emphasized is the importance of dealing with real weight, real materials, mm -hmm. and then an intuitive process of trying to solve for flexure or whatever, deflection or whatever uh, that particular project was built around. Mm -hmm. And in responding to a question about how um, digital evaluative software can be introduced to this project. Uh, his answer was something akin to that's like giving a baby a chainsaw, which was um, which was understood, I think, by everyone. Which is at a certain point, it's it's sort of too much. It sort of it can overwhelm an intuitive sense of sure. what is what is going on. Um, what's interesting to me is in seeing at the beginning of the age of ten. My children use like um, I think it's called West Point Bridge Design Software, yeah. which is a very available software where you <coughs> design your own bridges mm -hmm. for the maximum span, the least amount of material. Mm -hmm. and there's competitions and schools around it. My child would see that as intuitive yeah. play, right? Yeah. Sort of this kind of what we're calling a game. 
for it. So it's interesting to me this word intuition, mm -hmm. how I think maybe people in my generation see an intuitive process which is kinesthetic or haptic. It has to happen with the hand. Mm -hmm. And maybe my children's generation, which are not, they don't see or understand intuition, intuition in the same way. That they don't, it's not necessarily haptic with them. No. Um, I, 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 yeah. It's sort of a, a, more of an observation. Yeah. It's a kind of a question ultimately of where software is, is going, of either bridging those two worlds, yeah. of kind of experiencing the real world, well, or giving some representations of the real world. I, I think there's something funny really going on with, with uh, you know, people's ability to intuit out of virtual experiences. Okay. And I even had a funny experience in, in teaching Uda in, in a, day, a daylighting session in the class where my intuition about how daylighting works got changed by actually working with tools. I actually found out my intuition was wrong, which is kind of embarrassing since I've been doing this job and been teaching all these things for years and years. But my funny notion about how I should slope a roof to go ahead and get daylighting into the back of a space, you know, when we actually did a model uh, and I got to experience it virtually, and this whole thing like in Ecotech of bouncing daylight sun rays off of things, that's actually kind of like playing because I move the sun around and I see what it is and it kind of feels like a game as I watch the rays bounce around and stuff like that. Yeah, I learned very quickly that my notion was wrong because I wasn't taking into account the incident angle. I could describe the engineering behind why I was wrong, but something about dragging the sun through the sky and watching those rays go from here to there and not bounce back into the building, like it drove it home for me like, you know, in a way that none of my learning and none of, you know, all the schooling had never done before. So, yeah, I think yeah. there is something about being able to experience. There's a question about the order of things. Yes. Like, you know, as you were learning structures, I mean, everyone at some point has built those models, right? Yes. And they were tested physically. People put sandbags on them, right? And there's this kind of immediacy of the consequences of your design. But what I'm seeing now is that's, I mean, it's not happening that way for our children's generation, so sort of they're learning first with software tools. Now they may go back and do kind of, kind yeah. of real world testing. Well, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's, a it's, it's simulated reality. It's, it's always be interesting to see, you know, you know, can our kids learning social behavior through The Sims? You know, it's, it's, there's all these kind of very interesting things and in a way, I, I think they probably are. Like Adam, are you trying to chime in? What do you, what do you have to say? Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's very much a yes and uh, approach. I, and I, Glenn and I work at a software company, so it's really easy to to drink the Kool Aid and say software is the way to go. This is the you know the best way to model and test and analyze and you know digital prototyping and BIM are the end all be all. But I think Glenn and I. You know, we have our, our feet planted in the in education and in the world enough to know that that's definitely not the case. Uh, there's times when software can be uh, what you need, and there's times when you really need to get the students out and you know get them on a job site, get them uh, put materials in their hands, and uh, and it's the combination of the two that's really powerful. I think. Actually, so Uda, I'm kind of curious from your perspective. When your students, after they've, they've, they've played the game, you know, they've worked with their assemblies, they've done their analyses, you know, do you think they have a pretty good intuition as they go walk down the street from here, you know, back to their homes and they see that new building being built? Do you think they have a good sort of sense about, you know, what's good or bad about the, what they're saying? I think at one point, relatively to the end of our assignment, um, there was, we had a fantastic discussion because um, so we optimized things throughout the semester, and students figured that optimizing one thing um, means worse than the other thing. And they understood that it is their own job to decide what's not important. So optimizing shading um, compromises daylighting, and so on. And um, we had one project that I showed. Um, the, the site that we picked is not directly view south. And there was one student who just plopped the building diagonally uh, south facing into the sun. And so students then understood that there's such a complexity. If you have your window high, you get a lot of light in the back of the room, but you can't look out. Um, and not that they didn't know it before, but um, 
since they thought from the very beginning that these are optimization tools, they run into this conflict. How can I optimize now? Because when I optimize this, then the other is not optimal. It's optimal then. And um, so I thought, in the end, although we didn't talk much about designing, uh, the learning process about the responsibility of the designer to make sense of all this and uh, to, to find your own understanding of what is now important for my design, what keeps my design together. What's my design idea? It actually came back to what's the design idea and, and not about uh, is this daylight being optimized. Yeah. Um, and I thought this was, this was a really <coughs> good book. It is. I'm wondering, uh, Giuseppe, you guys are still in there. One thing I really like about you know the way they start the they, this whole multidisciplinary consideration, even at the earliest level for the beginning students, is that I think you know hopefully you start to have an appreciation of that. I think one thing you know in that linear model that I think a way a lot of engineering schools work, a lot of design schools work that I really worry about is you learn how to do all the analysis and the optimization of the individual things, and somehow the fact that they actually trade off and or they don't really, you have to find a combined optimum, which is really a hard thing to get your head around. It doesn't happen until too late, until that capstone studio, and even then, whether or not it really happens or you just put your slides together and get out because it's time to graduate is kind of a good question. So introducing that, at least that is a way of thinking that there really is no one optimum. You know, it's always this balance between these different things. And in fact, I think it's gonna become even more important because what's gonna happen, in it, or what's happening is, we're now starting to have the ability, okay, so we can give you energy feedback and we can give you uh, uh, sustainability feedback in terms of the life cycle cost of the materials you're choosing and I can give you cost feedback and you know, all of a sudden as a designer, every time you put anything down on the screen, I can give you about five different kinds of feedback about what the impact of that decision is, but really, you know, we, we know designers aren't ready, you know, like, uh, that's a little bit too much feedback, so trying to figure out how feedback gets into the loop, you know, and really how you can, you know, I'm not ready to optimize eight variables at once every time I take a step. And it's, you know, it's unclear about really, you know, like we have the computing power to do these things, but really how, how that actually handles, gets handled mentally is another process. Well, I was doing this start of the year with environmental systems class, and we talked about what's the level comfort, um, what's the sort of time to uh, So they need to have a, a bit of a conversation, but this actually can happen in parallel. Um, so when we talk in the third week, let's say, about the sort of time to try and find it, uh, and the humidity, uh, health effects, um, you know, in a temperature, they, in, a, in a building, they actually were talking about the same things in the, in the systems, or in the systems class. So, that year really worked well. And from looking through all the students, um, actually, I had really good feeling good projects and good like projects too. So, it was actually, I couldn't make really a, a difference. Uh, I couldn't really say that the way. Well, I think we we're at 20 minutes till four. We have a keynote speaker at 112 Kern. Um, I know Adam said there was no rock stars here, but I think Giuseppe and Giuseppe and his team and Rome said they're rock stars in the future. So <laughs> definitely, thank you guys for joining us. We really appreciate it. That was fantastic. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.